Good afternoon, everyone, and a happy new year. Welcome to the first CGC webinar of 2023. Today, we're showcasing the work of two of our poster winners from the CGC annual meeting last year in August. We have Axel Haudek from the Hearst Lab at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. And our second speaker is Dr. Jason Sullivan, a senior scientist in the Griffith Lab at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis, Missouri. But before we start our talks, I just wanted to remind everyone that our annual meeting is August from August 6, uh, 13th to the 16th in St. Louis. So if you have any original genomic findings from clinical or research setting and would like to share, we encourage you to submit an abstract. We would also like to invite trainees and technologists to apply for the Trainee and Technologist Award. The deadline to submit the abstract is Tuesday, February 28th. And as always, we would also like to encourage those who are interested to join the CGC. Uh, there are a number of benefits, such as being able to connect with new colleagues, initiate collaborations, and access educational opportunities. It also enables you to serve on a committee or work group, gives you reduced registration for the annual meeting, and have a free online subscription, subscription to the Journal of Cancer Genetics, among other things. So please check out our website for more information regarding this. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Axel Haudek. He's a PhD candidate in the Hearst Lab at the University of British Columbia. He attended the University of California, Berkeley for his bachelor's degree in molecular and cell biology in French, where he was a research intern at the Gladstone Institutes at the University of California and the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle. After graduation, he enrolled in the Genome Science and Technology Program at UBC's Michael Smith Labs in September 2019 and joined the Hearst Lab in January 2020. At the Hearst Lab, Axel's research focuses on interpreting cell type specific epigenetic data sets and characterizing the interactions between various epigenetic marks and genetic variants in human breast tissue, which is what he's going to be talking to us about today. Thank you, Axel. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction, Shamini. So yes, hi, my name is Axel, and today I'm going to be presenting um, what I presented for my poster in August, which is cell type specific genetic to epigenetic relationships in the human breast. So just as a big picture introduction to the epigenome, so the epigenome regulates gene expression to facilitate cell identity and function. So this is a series of, this is a general term for a series of modifications that are deposited onto genetic material in cell types. Um, so this can come in many forms. So uh, this can come in the form of heterochromatin, which is compacted uh, regions of the genome that are inaccessible to transcriptional machinery, as well as euchromatin, which makes it easier for genes to be transcribed, um, as well as histone variants, which uh, can uh, be different depending on uh, what sequence they're on, such as uh, variants that are specific to promoters. Um, as well as methylation on cytosines. And what I'm focusing on today is uh, histone modifications, which are post-translational modifications that are deposited on the tails of the histone proteins that uh, DNA is wrapped around. And these, variant, these histone modifications can be both a cause or a consequence of transcription, and they're very important uh, for gene regulation. So... <clears throat> The way that the epigenome is uh, deposited uh, on and uh, set in cell types is uh, can be determined both by genetic and non-genetic factors. So the one that's the some of the ways that it's least dependent on uh, genetic factors is uh, through cellular differentiation. So of course, the epigenetic identity of certain cells is dependent on the identity of its parental cell cell types and also the immediate microenvironment that's around different cells. Um, but besides this, there's a lot of ways that the epigenome can actually be directly modified by underlying alleles in the genes, uh, in, in the genotypes that uh, are either directly adjacent to it or even um, megabases away. So, and this can be kind of split into two different types. So you can have variants that only have that, uh, you can have variants that are robust to different cell types and it'll always, uh, and will almost always, as far as we can tell, uh, have an impact on uh, the epigenome. 
Um, and uh, in other cases, you can have uh, genetic variants that only impact the epigenome in certain cell types. And this can, of course, be a, be a factor of um, how different cell types will have uh, different epigenetic states in different areas. And uh, for example, if you have methylation in a promoter of a gene in one cell type, but not another, perhaps a variant uh, where there's a, it, close by to where there's no methylation uh, at a promoter will not have an impact there uh, for that cell type. And so <clears throat> the, the outcome that you get from this is that oftentimes uh, for the, at a single locus, um, for one cell type, having different alleles at that locus will not have an effect on the epigenome, whereas for other cell types, uh, it will have an effect on the epigenome. So the instances where the epigenome uh, is impacted uh, by variants in uh, one cell type, but not another, is has not been very well explored over the past years. Uh, the majority of studies that look at the interaction between genetic variants and epigenetic states do so at a, a bulk tissue um, a level. And um, only a few studies have emerged over the past years that have looked at this uh, at, at the cell type specific level, and they found anywhere between 18 and 50% of variants having an impact on uh, various molecular markers, such as uh, EQTLs, which are uh, exp for expression, uh, or HQTLs, which are for histone modifications. And so QTLs is just a term uh, that has been assigned to these instances where a genetic variant will have a molecular impact. And that's short for quantitative trait locus, because you can actually count the number of alleles from zero to two and regress that over um, the impact that that would have on accumulation of uh, some sort of molecular feature, such as methylation or histone modification peaks, or even the binding of uh, regulatory elements such as transcription factors. So you might be wondering, so what, what does this have to do with cancer? Because of course, this is the Cancer Genomics Consortium. So what I'm focusing on is how genetic variants um, occur in uh, different um, and, and manifest themselves in different cell types of the breast and how that could have uh, potential uh, impacts on disease and pathogenicity. So um, this is pretty important in the breast because uh, it's emerged over recent years that the healthy breast can contain uh, pre-existing known cancer driving, uh, even genetic variants in the absence of uh, actual cancer uh, occurring. And uh, these variants can occur uh, and are maintained throughout the lifespan of individuals in the organ and the clonal subpopulations that can carry them uh, either in subpopulations or uh, throughout the entire breast if it's uh, if it was inherited uh, through the germline um, these can occur and there can be potential uh, positive selection for mutation in tissue specific driver genes so my question is could the pathogenicity or the impact of variants whether these are germline and inherited throughout the entire organ or somatic and occurring only in uh, clonal subpopulations be buffered or modulated by the existing uh, cell type specific epigenetic context that they're behaving within and this could also potentially help understand why uh, breast cancers arise in different cell types and um, why they might be uh, uh, more pathogenic, uh, why different types of breast cancers can be more pathogenic. And then furthermore, uh, can we map instances uh, in general of these uh, cell type specific uh, genetic to epigenetic impacts uh, within different cell types in the breast? And this, because this has never been done uh, in the breast and only one, um, only one very recent paper has done this in solid tissue. Uh, so uh, there's a dearth of information on how um, the genome can impact the epigenome in these uh, com complex solid tissues. So um, in order to, to address this um, at the uh, um, at the Hearst lab and, and with our collaborators, uh, we've worked with breast tissue uh, and we've um, sorted them, uh, sorted breast tissue into uh, four constituent cell types, which we've then profiled. So uh, just as a diagram of uh, the breast, so uh, it's composed of a set of branching mammary ducts uh, within a stromal region 
And um, the duct is composed of luminal cells that are interspersed with luminal progenitors. And then all of these are surrounded by basal cells. And then in the outside stromal regions, uh, you have a mixture of different cells, which include adipocytes, fibroblasts, and other cell types. And so with facts, we were able to, were able to sort these uh, um, into four uh, previously defined, these four of these previously defined cell types based on surface markers. And then uh, we performed sequencing, uh, we did whole genome sequencing on all samples, as well as uh, RNA sequencing and uh, chip sequencing for histone modifications on uh, six uh, separate histone modifications. Um, and this was done for eight individuals with four cell types for each individuals. And this was additionally done on top of that for three uh, previously established um, mammary epithelial cell lines. Uh, MCF10A and HTERT L9 and L2. And so um, with this data, what I found was in general, uh, the histone mark peak coverage, so just focusing on the histone marks right now, did a really good job at recapitulating uh, the known breast cell type relationships that have previously defi been defined from surface markers alone. So here I was just looking at uh, H3K4ME3, which is a histone mark that uh, marks active uh, promoters, and looking at the the peak fractional overlap of these uh, of called peaks for H3K4ME3 on top of promoters. And uh, in general, uh, for most individuals, it did a pretty good job at distinguishing uh, the different cell types um, that carry within the individual samples. And there's also the uh, cell line data as well uh, in green that are somewhat intermediate for H3K4ME3 of all the different cell types. And then um, this can also, and so just looking at the different histone modifications, I found that this was the case as well for HK27 acetylation, um, HK4ME1, and and um, all the and all the other ones. Um, so despite this, uh, these functional genome sequences that you can observe and notice that they're covered by different amounts, uh, different in different amounts by. Um, the histone marks in question, uh, there's still some variability within the same cell types across the eight individuals. Um, so what I wanted to ask was to what degree is the genome driving this variability? Since of course, uh, if you look at BCs across all eight individuals, there's another variable, which is the fact that each individual will have a unique genotype that's underlying the accumulation of uh, epigenetic marks, such as H3K4ME3 and H3K27 acetylation. And um, potentially, are any of these examples of regions where the genotype is driving a change in the epigenome, even within the same cell type, potentially disease relevant? So to do this, what I did was I combined uh, whole genome sequencing data and chip seq data, and so I called variants using the whole genome sequencing data, and then I aligned the chip seq data in a reference biased, robust manner that was aware of the different variants that were um, uh, present in each individual, and uh, to, and uh, doing this allowed me to map what I've termed cis HBTLs, uh, which is cis histone binary trait loci. So as opposed to quantitative trait loci where uh, it's measuring a, a, a continuous trait as a function of how many uh, different alleles of a variant an individual would ha will have. What I was looking at was only a binary trait where, um, where uh, allele coincided consistently with uh, the presence or absence of a peak across the cohort. And so I'm illustrating this on the left here, where, for instance, across the eight individuals, uh, you'll have one allele that coincides with no peak, but for the individual that does have a peak of, say, H3K4ME3, it'll have a, uh, an alternate allele or reference allele present that's different from the rest of the individuals in the cohort. And what was really interesting was that um, what I found was that the most... Uh, the majority of these alleles associated with histone peaks in a cell type specific manner. So when this would happen for one allele, the vast majority of the time, it would you would only see this in one cell type. So BCs, LPs, or LCs, or SCs, but not the others. And so about 80% of the time, this was the case. And about 20% of the time, um, uh, the same allele would drive a change in the epigenome in at least one uh, histone modification uh, in more than one cell type. 
uh, and only about 1% were robust to the four different cell types. And um, uh, these alleles had an impact uh, across all different cell types of uh, the breast. And um, no matter what cell, what, no matter what um, histone modification was looked at, the cell type specific specificity was maintained. And then just looking at um, what these cis-HBTLs uh, variants were, uh, they were mainly formed by common variants according to dbSNP, and they tended to be singletons. So most of the instances that I found was where one individual had a variant and a peak co-localized and the rest of the individuals didn't or vice versa. You had like, such as seven individuals have a, having a variant and a peak and the one individual that didn't have that same variant allele, the, the coinciding histone modification peak dropped out. So what I ended up with was essentially a really big list of these variants. And for the next part here, what I was really trying to do was to see if there was any uh, biological relevance to these, uh, either uh, from the data itself uh, that I could find within the data itself or comparing it to other um, lists of variants um, that exist in the literature that have known uh, impacts on gene regulation. And so um, just as a first look, I wanted to see within the peak sets of the different histone modifications, which of them seem to be driven more by the by variant alleles. So which of them have a higher density of variants that drive changes in the epigenome? And what I found that was really interesting was that active marks um, are tend to be uh, over tend to have an overrepresentation of um, uh, epigenome driving variants within them compared to repressive marks. So HGK4ME3, which is uh, signals active promoters, and HGK27 acetylation, which signals active uh, promoters and enhancers, uh, as well as HGK36ME3, which uh, which is uh, coincides with actively transcribed gene bodies. These tended to have a higher density of variants that um, were linked to some change in the epigenome compared to other marks, uh, which tend to be repressive, with the exception of uh, HGK4ME1, which is a poised enhancer gene. Um, and so I found this really interesting, and I thought that. Uh, and it might be a signal of how these active marks that are activating are more sensitive to underlying changes in allelic state. Um, and then after that, what I wanted to look at was um, heterozygous loci and to see what alleles were carried within peaks. Uh, that formed above cis-HBTLs. And I found that in, in general, the peaks forming above loci in active histone marks, such as H3K4ME3 and H3K27 acetylation, uh, and in this case, H3K4ME1, they tended to, to actually carry the allele that was driving um, the cis-HBTL relationship. And so what this told me was that um, in these active marks, there seemed to be some sort of recruitment in cis of the epigenetic mark in question on the actual same strand. And uh, potentially also it showed that there was this increased allelic sensitivity uh, to these uh, in these promoter and enhancer defining histone modifications. And what was also interesting too was that uh, sort of uh, uh, bolstering what's been seen in the literature with variants that have an impact on um, uh, that have an impact on gene regulation. Um, uh, compared to the actual histone mark that they're associated with, the variants um, that are driving the changes in uh, the accumulation of histone modifications tended to be more in, occur more often in intergenic regions and tended to be depleted in exonic and uh, coding sequences, which tell which is uh, which is similar to what you would expect for uh, quantitative trait loci, where uh, these variants tend to be uh, exist between genes and enhancers and uh, promoter regions and rather than in the actual exons and gene bodies themselves. Um, and furthermore, so uh, there are also data sets that exist out there, uh, such as GTEx, that have looked at expression quantitative trait loci, so looking at how variants have an, have an impact on expression. And I found that um, my list of uh, cis-HBTLs was enriched, uh, especially for the cis-HBTLs that were found in uh, active histone modifications in uh, the GTEx datasets. 
um, which shows me that if there, there's probably some sort of regulatory enrichment for regulatory impact going on within my list of variants that uh, seems to be changing uh, uh, presence or absence of uh, histone modification peaks. And so the the mechanism by which these variants would would most likely occur uh, would be impact on some sort of uh, would be impact on some sort of transcription factor motif where the presence of a variance would either would either uh, create or disrupt an existing transcription factors uh, binding site. And so what I wanted to look for, and then this would have a uh, downstream impact either on histone modification presence or even uh, transcription. And so what I wanted to look at then was to if if these cis-HBTLs are enriched in predicted transcription factor binding site uh, creation or disruption events for transcription factors that are upregulated in the same cell type, because, of course, I had access to uh, the four different the variants that were uh, changing the epigenomes in four different cell types. And then also from previous literature, we know uh, which networks of transcription factors tend to be overexpressed in LCs, LPs, BCs, and SCs. And what I found was that, in fact, this was the case. So um, a transcription, uh, a variant that had an impact on the epigenome in BCs was also more likely to disrupt or create a, a transcription factor binding motif of a transcription factor that's upregulated in BCs as well, uh, compared to a transcription factor that's upregulated in any of the other cell types. And I did this for predicted transcription factor binding site uh, creation or disruption variant um, events, sorry, uh, from a software pipeline called at SMP. But I was also able to replicate this for a set of in, v, uh, sorry, in vitro um, defined uh, transcription fi uh, factor binding site creation or disruption events um, that was done in a paper uh, by Yan in 2021. Um, and they termed these uh, uh, PBSMPs. Um, for preferential binding SMPs. And I found that in luminal progenitors, at least, uh, there was an increase in the coincidence of uh, luminal progenitor cis-HBTLs within the set of um, uh, variants that were had a, an impact on, um, that had an, uh, a variants that, imp that impacted uh, transcription factors that were upregulated in luminal progenitors. So with this, what I wanted to do was to narrow down uh, variants that had an impact on, um, on transcription. And so to do this, I combined my cis-HBTL set with RNA-seq data, and I annotated cis-HBTLs by uh, transcription of their nearest genes. And I defined those where the allele um, uh, co-varied with transcription. And then I sorted uh, by uh, instances with the highest variation across the cohort, and then visually verified nine candidate variants. So going from about 8 million variants that were unique across the cohort to about 450,000 that uh, had some effect or were associated with changes in epigenetic state, down to about 2,000 that were associated with transcription, and then the uh, nine of them that were the highest variant varying that I verified. Um, and what I found was that this list was overrepresented with uh, previous annotations for impact on um, a regulation, uh, both in GTEx uh, in, in some instances, as well as in unrelated studies that were looking at uh, quantitative trait loci. And one of these was pretty interesting because it lent itself to a sort of natural experiment because uh, not only did the seven individuals had the reference allele and have lower expression of ANXA1 compared to the one individual that did, but this was replicated across the three cell lines that we that I um, also observed. So uh, MCF10A, which had the reference allele um, for RS75071948, had lower expression of ANXA1. And the other two cell lines that had the alternate allele had elevated expression of ANXA1 relatively. And I found that this was also robust uh, to the sample type um, with a two-way ANOVA. And so uh, this sort of presented itself as an interesting candidate uh, for validation to see if RS75071948 is uh, sufficient to drive change in expression of NXA1 in only the cell type that it was found in, so luminal cells. 
So just to illustrate this, uh, you can see the variance and the peak for the uh, primary sample. So this comes from the luminal cells and then the variant present in this uh, two cell lines, uh, H2L9 and H2L2. And then these, uh, the individual with the peak and the variant uh, has elevated, has higher expression of Annex A1. And this is also the same for the cell lines that have the peak and the variant have higher expression of Annex A1 compared to MCF10A. And it's also quite interesting too, because Annex A1 is uh, quite an interesting gene uh, when it comes to cancer. It's linked to various outcomes. So um, it, it, in certain cancers, uh, expression is much lower, uh, is, is significantly lowered in ANXA1, whereas in other cancers, uh, ANXA1 uh, uh, is highly expressed. And even within different forms of breast cancer, um, in, um, uh, ANXA1 is decreased, whereas um, in other forms, uh, ANXA1 is increased. So could it be that the presence of uh, a, could it be that different uh, mutations or variants are interpreted and uh, impacted differently um, uh, depending on uh, depending on the cell type that they occur in? So a uh, work in progress that I'm uh, currently doing is to actually knock in uh, the alternate allele of RS7507-1948 to determine if it's actually sufficient to drive a change in Annex one expression. And um, I'm currently sorting cells that have the uh, have successfully been edited. And then what I'd want to do is to, of course, verify the allele and um, to do a, a TACMAN assay on Annex A1 uh, to see if there is actually a change in expression, uh, as well as ChIP-seq to see if the uh, hvk 4 me 3 uh, histone modification peak that I observed only in luminal cells that had the variant uh, is reproduced when I actually knock in the alternate allele of RS7507-1948. Um, so that's it for my presentation. Thank you so much uh, for listening. Um, and yeah, uh, happy looking forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Axel. Um, so I just want to ask the attendees, the audience, if you have any questions to please put them in the Q&A box. So we have a couple of questions. I'll just start asking them. So the first question is, um, have you noticed histone acetylation also in breast cancer cells? Um, so I, I, I've, I haven't, so this, the entire system that, that I've shown today is all for, um, is, is for the healthy breast system. So it doesn't have, um, I, I haven't looked at breast cancer cells and the cell lines that I'm working with MCF10A, those are also representative of, of non, uh, cancer cell lines. Um, but in, so I, I don't really know, but what I can say is that just in general, um, Histone acetylation is going to be is definitely going to be present in in breast cancer cells. I don't know, um, but and and it could be in um, yeah. So it could be in like uh, in cancer driver genes or or cancer not driver genes. So um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so another question. Uh, I guess it's related again to actually cancer specific tissue. So the question is. NXA1 expression in transform cell lines. The question is, um, do they undergo multiple passages? Um, and then have you seen this in any primary breast cancer tissue? So um, I haven't seen this, but I've, so for, I guess there's two parts to the question. So I'll try to address them separately. So yeah, the, um, the cell lines have undergone uh, multiple passages uh, for sure. Uh, I've had to passage them like while uh, during the process of editing them. Um, and I don't know if this is, but like all the comparisons that I've done are between the same passage number, at least. I don't know if this is what um, what's being alluded to in the question. Um, but, and then also for, um, have I seen any change in Annex A1 expression in primary breast cancer tissue? So I haven't, but um, I've looked into the literature to see uh, like what, what's out there. And um, I saw that there, like, for example, in TCGA uh, for uh, 
basal-like uh, breast cancer elevation in uh, NXA1 uh, expression uh, coincided with worse outcomes. So there is, there is, there are, there's definitely change in expression of ANXA1 um, in breast cancer, but I haven't studied that directly myself. I've only looked at it through the lens of healthy, uh, these healthy samples. Thank you. Just trying to see if there's any other questions. Um, I don't see any for now. Um, if there are additional ones, we can uh, also ask towards the end of um, Dr. Jason Saliba's uh, Q&A session as well. So I think we can maybe move on to our next speaker. Thank you, Axel. So our next speaker is Dr. Jason Saliba. He's a senior scientist in the Griffith Laboratory at the Washington University School of Medicine. His research is focused on the development and improvement of protocols, classification guidelines, and training methods related to the curation and interpretation of clinically significant information, advancing precision medicine and cancer. He was the first full-time editor of the Clinical Interpretation of Variants in Cancer, or the Civic Knowledge Base, which is an open source, open access, community-driven web resource for the curation of somatic variant evidence. Dr. Saliba founded and chairs the Pediatric Cancer Curation Advancement Subcommittee, which is a collaborative between CIVIC, the ClinGen Pediatric Cancer Task Force, and Disease Ontology. He serves as a coordinator of the ClinGen Somatic Cancer Clinical Domain Working Group, its task forces, and somatic cancer variation, variant curation expert panels. So today he will be introducing us to the work done by one of these expert panels and talking about a standardized assessment of oncogenicity and clinical significance of NTRAC fusions. Thank you, Dr. Saliba, the floor is yours. And for the audience, if you have any questions, if you could please put them in the Q&A box. Thank you. Thanks, Shamini. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna talk to you guys about uh, some of the things we're doing within ClinGen and um, in Civic as well. So thanks for that introduction. And um, let's start out with a, just a review of what the um, NTRAC genes are. So we're talking about the uh, neurotrophic receptor tyrosine kinase genes. Um, they're both uh, important diagnostic and therapeutic markers. There are three of them, NTRAC 1, 2, and 3. Um, they all have a C-terminal uh, tyrosine kinase domain, or TKD, uh, and their expression is tightly regulated. However, all three are involved in uh, fusions, and with them, usually as the NTRAC gene is a three prime partner, and this leads to aberrant expression of the NTRAC uh, tyrosine kinase domain, which then results in a downstream pathway signaling um, activation, like in the MAP-PK pathway. Uh, NTRAC fusions are established oncogenic drivers. Uh, they're found across diverse pediatric and adult cancer types. Uh, they're important diagnostic and therapeutic markers. Um, and these create also some really uh, major clinical interpretation challenges uh, based on the rapid pace of new fusion discovery, uh, diverse fusion partners and cancer types found within these fusions, uh, inconsistent and incomplete reporting of the data elements of the fusions, and really the lack of standardized gene fusion classification rules. So um, one of the ways to address these challenges is through a community approach of experts um, that have all formed under the umbrella of the Clinical Genome Resource or ClinGen um, Semantic Cancer Clinical Domain Working Group. Uh, within this group, uh, we formed highly specific somatic cancer uh, curation variant expert panels or SCVSEPs to standardize and sustain the interpretation approach related to their gene or disease of interest based on the completion of this uh, ClinGen SCVSEP approval process um, down on the right, where they would originally start to define their scope and goals, they would develop varying classification rules, they would pilot those rules, and then look at long-term implementation in order to sustain their um, clinical interpretation efforts. Um, all curations um, from these entities of the somatic uh, CDWG are entered into CIVIC. And CIVIC is an open access, open source knowledge base and curation platform designed to support the clinical interpretation of variants in cancer. Uh, this knowledge base is free to use. As I said, it's open access and open source. Uh, it's publicly curated and expertly moderated. And there's a public revision history and has no login actually required for access so anybody can see what's been entered and what has been changed um, within the knowledge base. Um, CIVIC houses evidence uh, from the published literature um, that related to the impact of a variant as demonstrated in a clinical or preclinical setting uh, related to uh, therapy response, diagnosis, prognosis, um, oncogenicity, or functional impact at the protein level, uh, 
evidence is entered in a structured manner uh, based on the fields that are listed here. And these are both then human and machine readable. Civic is a crowdsource resource and expertly moderated. As evidence is submitted by curators in a Civic, it goes through a thorough review process um, by expert editors that are highly trained in the Civic data model. Editors verify the accuracy and relevance of the information submitted. And then any changes to the evidence item are tracked and readily accessible. Once an evidence item is verified, um, it goes through, um, it then goes from the submitted state in the knowledge base to the accepted state. So one of the goals for the SCV steps is to collect evidence on a gene or variant of interest and then create assertions um, based on the collected evidence, which summarize the current state of the field. We have two overall types of assertions in Civic, um, one being clinical, um, which contains uh, assertions related to drug response or predictive or prognosis and um, diagnosis. And when um, we can apply um, the AMP, ASCO, CAP, tiering, and levels to these particular assertions. Another type of assertion that we have are oncogenic assertions, where we, where we can um, assess the oncogenic, oncogenicity of a particular variant, whether that would go from oncogenic, likely oncogenic, variant of uncertain significance, likely benign or benign. And these are based on the ClinGen CGC VIC um, standards uh, uh, SOP that was published uh, in May of 2022. So now this brings us back to the um, NTREC SCV SEP that was actually formed to standardize the interpretation and create high quality clinical interpretations of these NTREC fusions. Um, to illustrate the need for like this focused expert, uh, this focused expert panel, um, we search PubMed for NTREC fusions and you get 728 results. 75% 75 75 of these results are from the last three years and 90% in the last five years alone. There's a ton of data to go through, and it's only expanding as we learn more and more about how important these are as, product, as, um, as therapeutic and diagnostic markers. So we need to determine kind of what fusions could be targeted by actually FDA-approved therapies. So this um, VSEP that's chaired by Gordana Rasa and Ange Moy Roy um, came together um, with the following goals of collecting, curating um, NTREC fusion manuscripts, generating a comprehensive list of NTREC fusions and gene partners, and then overall standardizing the NTREC fusion oncogenicity classifications. So one of the first things we did as a, as a NTREC VSEP was to define the landscape of NTREC fusions. So we scraped um, six public knowledge bases uh, that contain um, fusion information and pulled in all these information and shown them in the alluvial plot over here that we ended up coming up with 74 NTREC fusions that came um, from this uh, from this scrape and uh, determined that of these 74 fusions that there were uh, 69 reported uh, unique um, five prime partners for the three different NTREC genes as there were five that had some overlap with either two or three of the NTREC genes. Uh, but we now know this to be quite an underestimate um, as there's likely from our even just our PubMed literature searches um, that there's likely over 90 reported NTREC fusions that are out there. And we also know that there's more of these um, five prime partner genes that pair with more of these NTREKs. Um, so this database information is incomplete. And we also know that from this upside plot on the other side, that if we look at um, NTREK fusions that appear in at least five or more of these databases, we only find 14 of the 74 fusions that were found. Um, so there's really not a lot of overlap that's seen within these databases. So there's not really one comprehensive resource out there for what NTREK fusions are out there. So our goal as an SCV step is to have all these um, all of the uh, NTREC fusions then listed in the civic knowledge base based on our curation efforts. So the other part about this that's really important is that the oncogenicity SOP that I mentioned earlier um, is not applicable to fusions. And there's actually no standard out there for fusion assessment that doesn't exist at, for assessing it based on oncogenicity. So the SCV set went out there and decided to create our own protocol for this. And we're doing it based on um, according to three primary uh, specification categories, uh, structure, as, uh, associ uh, cancer association, and clinical validity and functional evidence. Um, so let me see, I don't know if the pointer is coming up, but let me see, now it will be. Uh, so we have these three different areas. So within fusion gene structure, we basically have three different categories in here that to get the FG1 designation, we would expect the NTREC, uh, NTREC would be the three prime partner, that, that would be the expected gene orientation. 
to get the FG2 designation, um, the fusion breakpoint would have to occur prior to the three prime um, tyrosine kinase domain of the uh, NTREC that's in question. And then the um, FG3 designation to become applied would have to be, would only be applied if it, that this actual fusion resulted in the three prime NTREC tyrosine kinase domain actually being retained within the reading frame based on the fusion and breakpoints that are there. The next part is the cancer association. So whether or not that this is CA1 would get uh, applied, whether or not it was a known fusion, meaning that it's decide, described recurrently in cancer literature in greater than three or more individual cases. CA2 would be applied whether or not the novel fusion be, was with a known five prime partner, meaning that the five prime partner gene described was with other three prime partner genes in cancer, not just NTREC, but it was found in other, um, other cancer situations with different um, five with three prime partner genes. And then CA3 can be applied um, whether or not the novel fusion um, is, is actually, it's not, the novel five prime partner isn't found with other partners, but it's fat, but the actual disease that we're talking about is something where NTREC um, fusions are typically found in that particular type of cancer. The next part we can go through is the clinical validity, where you get the CV, a fusion would get the CV designation if we find one or more cases that demonstrate a therapeutic response to targeted NTREC inhibition by either um, liratrectinib or entrectinib. As of right now, those are the two um, main drugs that are used to target NTREC. And then you can get the FS1 designation based on whether or not there's in vitro or in vivo evidence of a signaling pathway activation, transformation, or oncogenesis, or and get FS2 designation based on there being supporting evidence of increased expression of a kinase partner based on RNA-seq or um, IHC staining. And all these, all these codes up above combined can end up getting our oncogenicity classification, whether that comes anywhere from likely oncogenic or oncogenic to likely oncogenic to uncertain significance all the way down to benign. And really focusing on the three here from uncertain up to oncogenic, there's multiple different ways to get to these levels based on the combination of codes that you have. Um, so I think what I can do is go through just kind of this um, flow chart um, that kind of shows one example of if we had a very rare NTREC or novel NTREC fusion that we were talking about and kind of how we go through this assessment when we collect evidence where we would look at the fusion gene structure and say, okay, is NTREC the three prime partner? And if it's not the three prime partner, it goes all the way down then to uncertain significance. Um, if, but if it is a three prime partner, and if the fusion includes a tyrosine kinase domain, it would get both the FG1 and FG2 designation. Um, and then we would go down and check out whether or not the fusion was in frame. Now, oftentimes these papers don't really report breakpoints and they don't report whether or not the frame status. So sometimes this is unknown based on the amount of information out there. Um, if it's an absolute no, it would go down to uncertain significance. But if it's unknown, we then go down through this list of two different um, arms. The first one is then we go through and assess cancer association. And if this fusion has part been found in greater than or equal to three or more cases, then we'll get the CA1 designation and go to oncogenic. If the answer to that question is no, and it's not a novel, and if it's a novel fusion five prime partner, or if it's in an, um, a disease that's associated with NTREC associate, uh, an NTREC associated tumor, you would get likely oncogenic, but if these are no, they would end up going to uncertain significance. The other way pathway to go down is looking at functional evidence and checking out clinical validity, meaning whether or not there was an actual case that showed a response. If there was at least one case, it could then get CV and go at oncogenic. Or if it was a no, um, we can then check out preclinical evidence, whether there's actual expression or changes in downstream pathway regulation. If those were yeses, we can get to likely oncogenic. However, if those were no's or they were unknown, we would then go down to uncertain significance. So I think the best way to do this now is to kind of go through a few examples of what we've done as an NTREC VSEP. So let's talk about um, our classification of the CANC1 NTREC2 fusion, where we did a massive literature scrape to collect papers and curate evidence um, from that literature and put them in a civic. We ended up finding um, nine papers that were relevant to, that mentioned CANC1 or NTREC2. Of those nine papers, four were just references to another paper. So they weren't giving us um, unique evidence that we could actually curate into civic. But five of those papers were. So we basically looked at all in all these individual five papers and then created evidence items from them. In this case, um, this is one of the examples of a paper where we created an evidence item. This EID um, uh, 10 uh, 360 was created from this paper that talks about a durable response to lyrotrectinib, um, I believe, in a six-year-old boy um, that had this CANC1 NTREC2 
um, in an ependioma. And based on with the information from the paper, we can clearly see that there, where the breakpoint is um, between CANK1 and NTREC2, uh, that includes exon 3 of CANK1 all the way to exon um, 16 of NTREC2, which does include the tyrosine kinase domain. Um, and then we can also see basically that what they show within their um, progression is from their MRI, that there was a mass that was there prior to larotrectinum treatment. And then after larotrectinum treatment, that mass was, was, uh, was basically gone. And the, uh, after two months of therapy, the, um, they showed significant tumor response and also cognition and memory um, were back to normal to baseline after this larotrectinum treatment. So what we're able to do is create this structured evidence item showing a predictive evidence item that supports sensitivity or response to the drug of larotrectinib um, for the NTREC2, uh, for the CANK1 NTREC2 fusion. And then this, is, you can see down here too, we have the structured source that's there that was linkable um, to go to the actual PubMed paper. Um, so all these different pieces of information are contained within this evidence item to find out where all this came from. And this statement summarizes what happened in the paper. So we did this then for all five um, papers that we found related to CANK1 and TREC2, um, one of which I just talked about, which was the case a case report showing sensitivity to larotrectinib. There was also another one, uh, another case study that showed a patient with a glioblastoma that responded to larotrectinib as well with a CANK1 and TREC2 um, fusion. Um, another paper described a patient with pilocytic astrocytoma that they used the CANK1 and TREC2 fusion to be diagnostic for that particular tumor type. And then in a sarcoma and glioblastoma, they found um, this fusion was also found in those two other cases that are described in these other two evidence items that can be found in CIVIC. So taking all these five evidence items together, we can then go through our rubric um, that we use to classify these um, fusions uh, based on the NTREC SCVSEP um, classification guidelines. So all three, all five of these evidence items all have FG1, where NTREC2 is the three prime partner, so they would get an FG1 designation. Um, three of them all describe um, the NTREC as uh, the tyrosine kinase domain being in frame based on the breakpoint, and two clearly demonstrate that this was in frame or state within the paper that they're in frame. Um, I just want to note too that the other three aren't listed because they just don't make a mention of it. None of them did something to refute that the fusion was in frame. Um, they just don't mention it. Um, but all three of these, based on these evidence items, we can get FG1, FG2, and three as part of our oncogenicity classification. Then we can go down to CA1, which is whether or not um, how many individual cases the tumor type has actually been found in. And each one of these is one of their own individual unique cases. So we get reach five cases, which is greater than three, greater than or equal to three. So therefore we have our designation of CA1 um, that it gets a check mark to. Um, we also know too that CANK1 is found with now another NTREC as well, and also with the ALK gene infusions in cancers. So it can also get this CA2 designation, and these are the PMIDs that um, verify that. And then we know too that um, from these, from two of these um, evidence items, that we have clinical validity, as in there are two separate cases that larotrectinib was given to a patient with CANK1 and TREC2, and they showed um, response to that particular drug. So if we take Oh, and also in one of the papers, we found um, through IHC that they confirmed the expression or overexpression of this particular um, fusion. So therefore, we can give it the FS2 designation. So all of these combine, FG1, FG2, FG3, plus CA1 and CA1 alone would get it to oncogenic or CV1 alone would get it to oncogenic, but all of them combined basically get this particular fusion to um, the oncogenic designation. So once we get all that information, um, what we then do as an SCV step is we create an assertion based on that particular assessment. So now we have, as I talked about before, now we have an oncogenic assertion that was created. Um, this is in Civic, you can follow the QR code to actually get there. Um, but this is um, our assertion number uh, 57 with the disease being solid tumor for the CANK1 and TREC2 fusion, uh, where it's an oncogenic assertion um, supporting um, oncogenic supporting the oncogenetic classification of um, this particular fusion where we would write up to basically go through this whole thing about why we're giving it the CA1, um, FG1, FG2, FG3 designations along with um, the CV and um, FS2 designations. So all of them are summarized here, which results in our oncogenic classification. Um, and underneath within a civic um, assertion, we actually list out then all of the evidence that's collected in order to show 
that support for that particular assertion and that particular um, classification. So that way, if a user wanted to say, okay, why is this assertion being created? They can then click on any one of these evidence items and get more information as to why that was actually done. And one of the cool parts that I'm happy to report about is that this is actually one of the first now, as a, we commented on the um, assertion that the NTREC SEV SEP approved and accepted this assertion at their meeting on January 9th and uh, on um, earlier this month. So the goal of this is, is that these SEV SEP assertions were going to be have a designation on that they are SEV SEP approved so that they know that there was this particular vetting process, particular way that these assertions had to go through and a, a higher standard for these to have to go through this particular um, approval process based on um, this group meeting monthly, going through all of the evidence and making sure that we really do have the correct state of the field to create these particular assertions and these assessments of um, these NTREC fusions. So I can take you through another um, couple examples that uh, quickly uh, for a few other um, NTREC assertions or NTREC fusions. This one in particular being um, SCP-2 and NTREC-1 that we ended up classifying as likely oncogenic. Um, this was fusion was found um, in actually only one case. We found two papers, um, but the two papers both describe the exact same case of a 49 year old uh, breast cancer patient um, where they found the CANC1, where they found this um, SCP2 and TREC1 fusion in uh, a lymph node uh, metastasis. And from the original paper um, describing this, uh, they ended up um, finding that both, you, they confirmed that the um, NTREC1 was the three prime partner, that the tyrosine kinase domain was in frame based on the breakpoint, and that but both retained and in frame. So we get both FG1, FG2, and FG3, which Gelser gets it to the um, likely oncogenic um, piece of uh, classification. But then in the second paper that was done in a follow up, they took a tissue sample and they actually did um, IHC staining on it. And they found um, they confirmed exp overexpression of the particular fusion. So that also gets us the FS2 designation. These are the only two papers out there in our literature scrape and trying to find any information on this. So for right now, what we have as far as our um, classification based on the two evidence items that were created that are shown down here um, in our assertion uh, number 62 that was been created, right now we have the designation of likely oncogenic. And what we can do as we move forward as an SCV step, we'll have protocols in place where we're going to go back and look at, especially those that are uncertain or likely oncogenic, um, frequently, like over every like six months to a year to two years to recheck to see if there's any more information out there that can maybe potentially change um, our designation of that particular fusion. And um, this is the uh, last example here that I'm going to show you is an NTREC3 um, scapper um, fusion that was that we have classified based on our protocols as an uncertain significance where there's a deletion that occurs on a chromosome 15 between the NTREC3 gene and the um, scapper gene that leads to this uh, fusion of the two, where we then have NTREC as the five prime partner. So if you remember from our um, codes, basically the first one we ask is NTREC the three prime partner? And then answer is no. And then even if we look at, um, so it doesn't get FG1 and therefore it wouldn't get FG2 or FG3 either because the tyrosine kinase domain is not retained and it's not in frame. So we don't get FG1, two or three, so we now go to the classification for this particular fusion as um, uncertain significance for this fusion that was found in um, a four-year-old girl with um, pigmented um, epithelial uh, melanocytoma. Um, to conclude, um, basically the ClinGen um, NTREC SCV step is addressing the multifaceted challenges of the clinical interpretation of NTREC fusions through the open access civic platform where we collect evidence and then ultimately create assertions um, with, for the um, oncogenicity classification based on the um, NTREC fusion SCV step um, oncogenicity classification system that we created. Um, the curation and NTREC fusion interpretations are ensured to be updated with the emergence of new information uh, based on the implementation and sustainability of the ClinGen SCV step process. And really overall, the strength of our interpretations are as strong as our community. So if there's anybody out there that's interested in either joining the NTREC SCV step efforts, or if you saw from the clinical um, from the overall ClinGen um, clinical somatic clinical domain working group, we have a lot of different task forces and VSEPs that work on a lot of different genes and problems out there in clinical interpretation. We'd be happy to have you come and contribute. So please um, consider joining our VSEPs, curating and civic. And one of the other things I'd like to kind of say too is if you have any NTREC fusion cases out there, publish them because that's the way we get them in evidence. And that's the way we can actually go through and make our assertions and our public um, classifications of them. 
So I just want to acknowledge again the um, chairs, Gordana Rasa and Angshmoy Roy of the um, NTREC um, SCV SEP, who pushed us to um, great things and great ways of classification, and all the members who go through and, and attend our monthly meetings, and thank the civic team and the, the Griffith Lab um, for all their input on, on civic and how we actually do these classifications and get them ready um, to be able to show and house them in a public setting. Uh, so with that, we can take any questions if there are any. Excellent talk. Thank you. Um, Jason, Does can you give an estimate of the time that it takes for taking one of these fusions through your pipeline and going through the literature available? Um, some we can do within like a week or two, <laughs> if that makes sense. Like the, the literature is great, it just depends. So we have some fusions out there like ETV6 and Trek 3 that have hundreds of papers that are out there. So you're talking about a pretty sustained um, curation. The one that I described like SCP-2, um, and Trek one that took about a month because there's only two papers out there. Um, they basically what we what we strive to do and what the, the SCV set process is going to be moving forward is we're in teams of experts and curators where we come together. Curators are going to go through comb the literature as much as they can and start to create evidence items. And then the experts go through the evidence items and say, OK, is this does this make sense to us? Or is there other they also then will chime in whether or not there's other papers that are out there. And then we present that to the group. And the overall group will then say, hmm, we think something's missing or we can add something else in. And that becomes another like maybe process for the curators to go back through and find that information. But I would say like for the the for these, it could take anywhere from about a month of work to do to about like a month to three months based on the revision process. Uh, but that's something that we're trying to, to refine. But it just all depends on the amount of information that's out there and how many curators we have working on it at any one time. Excellent. Second question. Um, this is there's a question about deletions in in our Q and A, and I it brought up the to mind. How do you handle cytogenetic papers versus molecular papers? Do you take into account cytogenetic papers where they might just show a break apart for intrek? So that depends. Actually, I think um, like it depends on what's there and what they're telling us. And this is what the problem is with fusion publications that are out there is a lot of times that this is unclear to us. Like that's not actually stated whether or not some are just said, okay, there's an NTREC fusion with something, but we don't know any details whether other than it's the three prime partner. We might not know if the tyrosine kinase domain is there or if it's included or not. So what we're doing for our overall assess, what we're doing for our assessment is we're trying to take the overall information out there to make this classification. Like the goal for our assertion and the goal for even our oncogenetic classification is not to do this just based off of one paper or one report out there. The idea would be is over time, we would accumulate more and more of these papers to get a better idea of what's going on. So when the information is unclear, we would hope that there would become more publications that are coming out later that would really show um, where the breakpoints are and whether or not the tyrosine kinase is there. That's why we kind of don't take one paper to say, like, okay, we can give it class, we can give the actual score based on one paper, but we want there, but that we can take multiple papers in order to get those individual classifications. So um, I think that's kind of how we're going about it, which is kind of more of a collective approach than one thing being there. We haven't yet come across as we've gone through this, which we know we're going to eventually, that there may be some conflicting information where sometimes a fusion may be found where the tyrosine kinase domain isn't included or it's not in frame, and other times it is. Um, and then we we're figuring out as an SCV step about how to kind of handle that information, but if more often than not, it's included, we would then be able to make that, um, give it that code and give it that, um, on, or give it that potentially oncogenic classification, depending upon how all the evidence stacks up. Excellent. I think this is uh, 10 a.m. or well, 10 a.m. my time, the end of our webinar. Um, so I'll leave it to Shamini to close. All right. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, thank you very much, Jason and Axel, for your talks. Um, if uh, you have any more questions, uh, you know, you can email us and we can forward it to them and put you in touch. Other than that, that's pretty much it for our webinar. And once again, I'd just like to remind everyone that our annual meeting is coming up uh, in a few months in August. And so the deadline for submitting the abstract is at the end of February. So 
If you have any findings that you would like to share, please do submit an abstract and also for the trainees and uh, technologists to apply for the awards. Thank you.